In this corner, the Marvel Legends X-Men 97 Jean Grey. And in this corner, the Marvel Legends X-Men 97 Madeline Pryor, also known as the Goblin Queen. Genetically, both of them are technically Jean Grey, but which one is the better action figure? Place your bets and stick around, it's time for another Versus. Starting with the packaging, and once again, we're back to our X-Men 97 blister cards. Recall what I said in my Magneto video about how heroes and villains square up in artwork, and notice how these two are placed. Already from the artwork, we can see that there's going to be some minor tweaks to Jean's design. As for how much the figure looks like that, it's going to be a discussion for the next category. But so far, I'm pretty excited for Goblin Queen. Obviously, it's a departure from the comic, but I do like the artwork and this design. Flipping it around, though, and this time they're both facing the same direction. Of the other figures, figures in the way, we've already looked at Magneto and Cyclops, and honestly, having looked at these cards so many times, I don't really know what else to say. For packaging, this round is a draw. Moving on to presentation, and Jean Grey comes to just under 6 inches, whereas the high heel wearing Goblin Queen hovers around 6 and a half. Goblin Queen's arms might be reuse, but otherwise these are two newly sculpted figures. Let's start with Jean. Comparing her to the 80 years version, we can see she's a bit shorter and that the costume has been streamlined. The center stripe no longer goes all the way down the bodysuit, the belt is a bit wider, and the thigh pads have been swapped out for some basic seam lines. Otherwise, the costume does maintain its blue and yellow-orange color scheme. From an engineering standpoint, though, I'm most curious about the torso. Instead of having any kind of a diaphragm joint or an ab crunch, it's just one solid piece, so it's going to be interesting to pit her against Madeline during poseability. Like most Lady Legends, she has a diaphragm joint. The thing I have the most mixed feelings about, however, is her head. I'm not saying she's ugly, but her face is definitely different than the card art. I'll be curious to see if I like the other head better. I'll also point out that the hair is a lot less detailed than Magneto's was. Compared to the previous figures we've looked at, which could slide into your comic shelf, this one is definitely more cartoony and simplistic. In that regard, the Goblin Queen has a lot more going on. Though, in fairness, her hair is pretty cartoony also. They did do a good job of capturing that lividity pink corpse color that she has on the card art, and in general, they did a great job of capturing her mischievousness. The costume is obviously a huge departure from the comic, but let's be honest, there was no way this was going to make it into what's essentially a Saturday morning cartoon or onto a Target shelf. It's worth noting that they did offer the Goblin Queen as a tier to trick us into buying that Engine of Vengeance Haslab, and even that wasn't comics accurate. And with no hope in sight for that figure to be released, this is all we've really got for now. Interestingly enough, the upper leg is covered in the action figure, but it was uncovered on the cartoon. I don't know if that's a change that Hasbro made, or if it's just one of those situations where the concept art was different when they made the action figure, but the figure does match the card art, which is the important thing. Jean is good and basic, with lots of simple, clean lines, but maybe too basic. For presentation, this round goes to Goblin Queen. Moving on to posability, and the articulation between these two is mostly the same, but with a couple of notable differences. From the top, and both heads are on dumbbell joints. Goblin Queen, of course, has that long, wild hair, so you know what that means. She can't look up, but Jean, with her more practical ponytail, has no trouble. But surprisingly, neither one of them can really look down. Goblin Queen also struggles to tilt her head, whereas Jean has no trouble in that department. Madeline can look side to side, but Jean gets all the way around. Additionally, her ponytail is poseable. It also pops out really easy though, so watch out for that. But they can raise their arms this high with Goblin Queen having the better range. It's worth noting that Jean's shoulder pads are nice and soft, so they're not getting in the way. Neither one has any kind of butterfly joint. They both have bicep swivel and pinless double jointed elbows with really deep bends. And as is typical for Marvel Legends, at the end of the arms are wrists that can swivel and hinge. Hinging that hand does, however, turn her palm blue shifting to the torso, and this is the biggest difference between the two. As I said in presentation, Madeline has a typical diaphragm joint, whereas all of Jean's torso articulation is in a ball joint in her waist. They're fairly equivalent, although I do think Jean has a slight edge. And one thing I should point out is that the weight of the cape does keep pulling this torso back. Otherwise, they can hunch forward this far, and Jean clearly has the edge. They can, however, both tilt and twist. It's interesting, because going into this review, I was pretty skeptical 
of Jean's lack of diaphragm joint, but it turns out that this way was more functional and better for maintaining the lines of the figure. Obviously a combination of both strategies would have given even better range, or a diaphragm joint and reverse ab crunch like this Black Widow, but for what it is, I'm happy. Moving on down and both ladies have ball jointed hips, they've got equivalent kicks, as well as equivalent spreads. Traveling down the leg and both of them have thigh cut, but Hasbro actually made the one on Goblin Queen lowered down the leg so as not to interfere with the boot. That was a nice touch and I really appreciate that. Both of them have pinless knees which are pretty even Steven. Missed opportunity here to give Jean a boot cut, but both have ankles that can hinge. And like Madeline Pryor, from good to bad to good again, Pivot. I'll admit that I'm surprised, but for posability, this round goes to Jean. Out of the box, and Jean has a fist and an open hand, and also a set of really open hands. Goblin Queen, by contrast, comes preloaded with really open hands, but she also has a pair of fists and some spooky green energy effects. Otherwise, the only thing Jean comes with is this alternate head, which I have to admit I do like better, but it still doesn't look quite like the artwork. Also, now that she has long hair, it's Jean's turn to not have very good neck articulation. Madeline does have one more accessory up her sleeve though. Baby Nathan Summers. Not the mama! For a newborn, that kid has a lot of hair. He's really adorable though, but for whatever reason, his costume is covered with plus signs that... Oh. This waddling is reused from Baby Hulk and Baby Nightcrawler, but playability is more than just babies and swappable parts. It's also about how well your figures play with others. First things first, and Professor X gets a nice little cameo in the episode flashing back to when he recruited Jean, so here he is. But shifting over to a few other X-Men 97 figures we've looked at, and here we have the good version of Magneto. Real quick, by the way, I need to make a correction to my Magneto video. I incorrectly stated that I thought he was built off of the Sunfire body. In reality, he was built off of Vulcan. A few of you pointed it out in the comments, but you were all very nice about it, so thank you all around. Next up is the villainous version of Magneto, and then here we have Cyclops. In the Inferno comic, Cyclops was in his X-Factor phase, so here's that version. And then for Wolverine, here's the X-Men 97 version of him, and the Inferno era brown and orange. Until we get to the X-Men 97 version, here's the retro card version of Rogue, and the 80s appropriate sweat into the oldies version. Rounding out the team is Remy Le Beau, who definitely had his share of bad experiences in the new episode. Don't worry, Gumbo. I can't unsee it either. I'll stop the world and meld with you. Next up is Storm, who we caught a glimpse of in the end of the episode, rocking her 80s-style punk rock costume. And then here we have Jubilee and Beast, who in this episode gave us one of his classic Oh My Stars and Garters. For some other X-Men, who were part of the Inferno comic story, and here we have Dazzler, Longshot, her Mojo World companion, Cyclops' brother Havoc, Iceman, one of the founding members of the X-Men, Archangel, who'd only recently been transformed in the comics by Apocalypse, and Colossus. Colossus brings us to his sister Ileana, also known as Magic, who not only had a big role to play in Inferno, but made a cameo in the episode thanks to Morph. Morph also briefly turned into Spiral. For a fun deep cut reference, here we have Demo Goblin, who was created during the Inferno story, but for the architect of Inferno and the big bad of the episode, here we have Mr. Sinister. For a relative scale comparison, here's Jean and Madeline, with Pete the Spidey and the Spectacular Spider-Man. And as always, here they are with Stealth Iron Man. Jean is a great and important addition to your team, and I do appreciate the alternate head, but Madeline has alternate hands, energy effects, and a completely separate character, while also being a character we don't have a 6-inch scale version of in any other form. For playability, this round also goes to the Goblin Queen. This leaves us with nothing left to discuss but the price. Both figures retail for $24.99 and come with similar piece count, but not only does Goblin Queen have more accessories, one of them is Baby Cable. That being the case, Jean Grey figures are notoriously expensive on the aftermarket, so if you want one for your collection, this is the most affordable option. On the other hand, this is the only 6 in scale Goblin Queen ever made, thanks to the comic version being used as HasLab bait. For price, this round is a draw, but the battle goes to Goblin Queen 4-3. What did you think of the latest episode, and do you think we'll see Madeline Pryor again? Sound off in the comments, and while you're down there, tell me your favorite Jean Grey costume. Of course, now that we've looked at this one, it does beg the question, which is the best 90s Jean Grey ever made? That, however, is a conversation for another day. If you like this video, check out one of these. Thank you so much for watching. I'll be back again real soon, but until then, play nice and have fun.